COVID-19 has made abundantly and tragically clear the disaster results of relying on your gut and abandoning science. Asking our fellow Americans to switch from Trump to Biden may also be asking them to change their self-image and even their view of the world. To overcome that sense of loss, we have to learn how to speak to our audience authentically and convey Biden will make the world a better place for them. Despite our differences, Democrats, Republicans, and independents are on the same unpredictable and perilous life journey. Between now and election day, each of us has a task of convincing those who share our life journey on a different path to leave that path and join us in supporting Joe Biden. Today, our club turns to the experts on how to develop a compelling story by understanding the mechanics and mysteries of the decision-making process. If much of our decision-making process takes place in the subconscious, we need not just politicians, but experts in the field. Today, our club turns to some of the country's leading thinkers on how to develop a compelling story to impact the voters' decision-making process by understanding the mechanics and mysteries of that process and recognizing how we are influenced by our subconscious. Dr. Gerald Zaltman was an influential member of Harvard's Mind Brain Behavior Initiative, an interdisciplinary group. Dr. Zaltman has investigated brain scans as a means of testing our decision-making process. He is the creator of the Zaltman metaphor elicitation technique, the first patented marketing research tool in the United States. It represents an unusual attempt to put some of the insights of neuroscience as a window into consumer attitudes toward everything from art museums and now elections. His numerous books have been translated into 15 languages and his works have been featured in the New York Times, Fortune Magazine, Forbes, US News and World Reports, and many more. I have just finished his recent book, Unlocked, which in fact unlocked how my subconscious controls my own views. Gerald Zaltman is the Professor C. Wilson Professor of Business Administration Emeritus at the Harvard Business School and co-founder of the renowned research and consulting firm, Olson and Zaltman. Dr. Zaltman has assembled a distinguished group of his colleagues to participate in today's presentation. They include Gretchen Barton, a seasoned researcher in policy and public health and head of business development, Olson Zaltman. James Four, who has led many research products for many of our country's major corporations and as head of insights at Olson Zaltman. Kirk Chaffetz, principal at Kirk Chaffetz and a leader in content marketing who has been engaged by major corporations to work on their messaging. And Simon L. Hage, adjunct professor at the Valenti School of Communications at the University of Houston and co-founder of the Texas-based consulting firm, Cross Cultural Marketing Group. Their collective goal is to give us the tools to engage, motivate, and influence voters who hold different priorities and positions from our own. Now, at, at any time during their presentation, please go to the Q&A button, which you will find at the bottom of your screen, and submit your questions. I will make an effort to see that our panel answers as many questions as we can in the available time. Now let's get started. Uh, Jerry, I, I turn it over to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bob. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this session. Uh, you'll see that it's titled, uh, Why Win? And we hope collectively to be sharing a number of ideas about storytelling as a response to that question. It's not just storytelling, it's what the story is. And each of us are going to uh, offer some perspectives on how we go about creating a powerful story. As Bob referenced, um, the election needs to be more than simply defeating Trump. As important as that is, that's the icing on the cake. 
What we really need to do is have a compelling story about our preferred candidates at, at different levels of uh, public office in how they respond to the needs of the nation in their uh, particular constituents. I'd like to start by providing an overview of some of the key ideas that I want to present. Um, and so let's move on with those. You'll, you'll see that various colleagues uh, will be making these same points each in their own way. I think of a story as a meeting place for minds. It's where a candidate and voters thinking link up, sort of like the uh, fork in a road where there might be picnic benches, if you can remember back the time when we were able to do that. A second point I want to make is that a candidate learns about voter thoughts and feelings at this meeting place. It is a special place to learn about their unconscious thoughts and feelings. Next, um, at this meeting of voter and candidate minds, voters get to ask the candidate, how will your leadership make my life more meaningful? And to that question, the, uh, we see that the <clears throat> Candidate provides uh, or should provide a coherent and authentic and emotionally compelling explanation. That explanation should be such that voters leave that meeting of minds, that meeting place, uh, knowing for sure that this leader has the wisdom, the vision, and the courage to slay the monsters out there in the woods, the monsters clearly being the various uh, problems uh, that threaten currently or in the future uh, voter well-being. I'd like to begin with um, a video, and this is motivated before we start it by a, a very compelling book by Howard Gardner, a psychologist at the Harvard uh, School of Education. Graduate School of Education. He uh, did a, a very impactful study of leaders ranging from Gandhi to Hitler. Uh, and he wondered, uh, among other things, what made them so effective. And one key answer that, they, that he and his colleagues found is that the leaders, each in their own way, lived the story they told. And while I might be getting a little critical later about some of the storytelling that, that happens in the political, on the political scene, um, this is an example of, I think, a great story, what is sometimes called the origin story, um, that summarizes key elements in the life that Joseph Biden has lived. Uh, so let's uh, proceed to watch this. When I was a young kid in third grade, I remember my dad coming up the stairs in my grandpa's house where we were living, sitting at the end of my bed and saying, Joey, I'm gonna have to leave for a while. Go down to Wilmington, Delaware with Uncle Frank. The good job's down there, honey. And in a little while, I'll be able to send for you and mom and Jimmy and Val, and everything's gonna be fine. For the rest of our life, my dad never failed to remind us that a job is about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your child in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay. And no, it's true. You never quit on America. And you deserve a president who will never quit on you. You know the country is responsible for the content of this advertising. This is, uh, as I mentioned, an origin story. It's, it, it resonates in many different ways with uh, his growing up, with the formative experiences in his life. 
And in recounting those formative experiences, a, a viewer can see how Biden will look out for, the, uh, for them, for their interests and protect them. Uh, so again, this is, a, I think, a very nice uh, example uh, provided by uh, a political action group, uh, Unite the Country. <clears throat> so the question now, moving on, if we can, uh, let's go back a bit. Uh, James, if you could just cycle back to the full screen, perhaps, or this screen. Um, what can go wrong in uh, a meeting of the minds, uh, during a meeting of the minds? And one answer is that a candidate or a campaign may only obtain a superficial or incomplete understanding of voters. This is uh, sometimes the result of what is called the convenient light syndrome in which you look for uh, lost keys uh, under a lamp light because that's where it's convenient to look. That's where the light is. Uh, it just turns out that it's not where the all important keys uh, were lost. Um, too often uh, surface level thinking by voters is gathered and heard. Um, and <clears throat> despite the sums of money, large sums of money uh, spent on voter research by uh, various campaigns and candidates uh, can be blind to unconscious thinking on the part of the voter. It's that unconscious thinking that uh, really drives voter experience. This is captured uh, partly by this cartoon. Here we see uh, parents who sincerely have the baby's best interests at heart. But what about the baby? What does the baby experience? A, is a totally different view. It has a totally different account of what's going on. Um, the parents missed something very, very important. Uh, that is, babies have a hardwired attraction, or we believe it's a hardwired attraction to faces virtually from the time of uh, birth. But that's not the view of this uh, lovely message that the uh, parents think they're, um, they're displaying. Another issue, and we'll leave this cartoon, involves the role of data in the kind of I think telling. Uh, to begin with, as we see in this quote, data do not tell stories independently. They do not speak for themselves. And while they appear to do so, it is because of a confirmation bias toward bringing forward what is already believed or expected. Uh, it's often said that uh, in, in well-documented that the primary role of reason is to justify an already arrived at belief or conclusion. The parents in the cartoon were guilty of this. Uh, here we see uh, a quote from one of the leading art, uh, experts in artificial intelligence, uh, saying that profound data are profound dumb. They can't tell you why you were smarter than your data. Data do not understand causes and effects, only humans do. And we know from studies of evolutionary development from a variety of different disciplines that people, voters, are hardwired to find meaning in information. The challenge is, is it the meaning the voter really intends? It is really uh, relevant to, uh, to, to the voters. Now, what happens 
when um, storytelling works well. And I'd like you to think of a movie you've enjoyed with friends. Perhaps you've gone to the theater together uh, and afterwards you're having uh, coffee and dessert or whatever. Um, and you discover that all of you uh, really love film and have uh, pretty much the same reasons for loving it in terms of its production, the role of the, uh, the way the story unfolds and so forth. But after a short while, you discover that each of you also has different interpretations of the story. Some of those interpretations are not just different, they conflict. And they're interpretations that you feel strongly about, positively or negatively. And this illustrates what I think is an important criterion for effective messaging and indeed advertising. Uh, it involves the principle of vague specifics. A story needs to be vague enough to allow people with diverse interests and orientations um, to find important meaning in the story. But it also has to be specific enough to trigger uh, idiosyncratic interpretations so that each person can find their own unique uh, uh, resonance not shared by others. Uh, <clears throat> no one story fits everyone the same way. People ultimately need room to personalize a message. Messages aren't injected uh, into someone's thinking or mind uh, the way a hypodermic needle might uh, deliver a medication, a cure. Um, it, rather, a message, uh, a story is jointly authored by voters and the candidate. This unconscious, uh, what we call co-creation or conceptual blending is often achieved through metaphor and is the hallmark of effective advertising. In effect, the joint authorship allows people to share the same basic message and thus find collective meaning in a story while also permitting them to find satisfying elements to uh, underscore what I said earlier that fit their more idiosyncratic or personalized needs. Thus a powerful story becomes both communal and individualistic. Now I've mentioned um, the importance of um, <clears throat> the un unconscious thinking. And so I'd like to conclude my portion of the presentation um, by stressing its importance. The evidence, and it's constantly growing, but I think quite sufficient now, is that all thinking originates below awareness and only occasionally do we become aware of it. It's the same thinking processes in our unconscious as in our conscious minds, but our experience of those different uh, domains is different. I don't want to get into the weeds of that discussion. So I'd like you uh, to just temporarily on an ad hoc basis, entertain the idea that uh, uh, all thoughts originate in the unconscious as if, if it were so. And you can just discuss it at a different, at a different time. Um, telling have to distinguish between what is on the surface of a voter's mind, such as attitudes and opinions that are accessible through surveys, for instance, versus what is deeply within a mind. What voters don't know, uh, they know. These consist of a voter's values, emotions, and related hidden thoughts and feelings generate, generated by feelings and emotions. What is important, even critical, 
is that none of these thoughts, conscious or unconscious, live alone. They don't exist in isolation. They form causal connections, what, what uh, Judea Pearl is so, so interested in, uh, amongst themselves. And these are often called mental models. Mental models are the unconscious viewing lenses all voters use to process political messaging. Uh, they are very, very important to, uh, to capture. But doing so is not always easy. Let's look at two quotes briefly, and uh, then I'll be concluding. One quote is from Lisa Barrett, one of the leading researchers today in the field of emotions. And she observes that the human brain is a master of deception. It creates experiences and directs actions with a magician's skill, never revealing how it does so, all the while giving us a false sense of confidence that its products, our day-to-day -day experiences, reveal its inner workings. The message, the takeaway here is that our minds are too clever to be trusted. And that idea is reinforced by uh, another quote um, from Robert Burton, a major uh, neuroscientist and psychiatrist. Um, he notes that our brains possess involuntary mechanisms that make unbiased thought impossible, yet create the illusion that we are rational creatures capable of fully understanding the mind that is created by these very same mechanisms. Now, in conclusion, let me observe that all research methods are compromises with reality. The challenge, as always, is to match the right method or combination of methods to the right research problem. And here is where the distinction between on a mind versus in or within a mind is important. Sometimes what is critical to know are the surface level attitudes and opinions on a mind. These are best collected with strip mining techniques. Uh, surveys are examples. I should note uh, that focus groups are also used, although unlike surveys, they lack, uh, in my judgment, uh, any scientific grounding. Storytelling, however, requires information about voters' values, emotions, and other unconscious or, or hidden thoughts and feelings that reside deeply within a voter's mind. Uh, it is also where uh, mental models live. For these reasons, I favor uh, for getting at what's deep within the unconscious, uh, lengthy metaphor-based in-depth one-on-one interviews to surface uh, unconscious processes and mental models. But that is a topic for another day. So I'm now going to uh, pass the baton over to James. Thank you very much, Jerry. Political researchers and strategists are awash in data, but as Judea Pearl observed, data are dumb and information is not insight. If you don't know the why behind how voters are feeling, all those numbers aren't really telling you a whole lot. In our travels, we've seen Democrats exhibit a tendency to rely upon what I call cupcake research, Looks good, goes down easily. It's addictive because you want more of it and it seems to give you what you want, but really there's not much there. It's lacking in substance. And if you lack a substantive understanding of voters, it's very difficult to persuade those voters. An example of this is some research from April. This was when President Trump was doing his first round of coronavirus briefings and this tweet appeared. One strategist told me that when voters were shown 90 seconds of one of those briefings, 
Trump's performance in a head-to-head -head matchup with Joe Biden improved by more than two points. Democratic Twitter was all a Twitter about this. Uh, chicken little, the sky is falling, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not quality research. It's, uh, it's sort of puzzling that uh, anyone with influence in the party would take this seriously. This is research that is, uh, invites people to react to slivers of information in a way that's divorced from how most people actually receive that information in the real world and in a scenario that does not reflect how voters actually make voting decisions. So as Jerry said, um, there, are, uh, there are various uh, methods, various approaches uh, that uh, we can take and seen uh, includes polling that uh, the Democratic Party tends to rely on a lot. Now, just to be clear, um, I'm not going to put polling into the category of cupcake research, at least not when it's used properly. Polling has tremendous value when it's used the way it's meant to be used. Uh, so it can help you understand the state of the horse race. You can use polling to make models. You can use it to gauge approval ratings. All those things are very important. If you're looking to count people, polls are perfect. If you're looking to understand people, they are less than perfect. For instance, Marist College asked voters in Kentucky their opinion of Obamacare and also of Connect, which is the state healthcare exchange created by Obamacare. Obamacare, very unpopular. Connect, a lot less unpopular. This isn't shocking, it's disturbing maybe, but not very shocking, but it shows a couple of things. First, it shows clearly that voters are not purely rational actors who always vote in their own best self-interest. And it also points out the limits of polling in that this does not tell you why. Now, obviously, one reason is that Barack Obama was not very popular in Kentucky and people down there didn't like him very much. But why is that? Why and why and why don't people in Kentucky like Barack Obama very much? Similarly, why is Connect, relatively speaking, so popular? This poll doesn't give you the answer to those questions. Polling is a tool. And like all tools, it's not good for everything. In the same way that you wouldn't use a screwdriver to pound a nail into a wall, we should not use polling to try to understand what people believe or why they believe the things that they believe or why they vote in the way that they vote. Because as Jerry said, those kinds of decisions are largely unconscious. So by definition, you can't use a tool that relies on conscious reflection to understand unconscious thinking. To really understand voters, you need to understand their beliefs, their biases, their worldview, the stories they tell themselves about themselves and the country. In other words, you really need to ask not just what, but you need to understand why. So these numbers on Obamacare, to know why, you need to ask why, and then you need to ask why again, and then you need to ask it again, and then you need to ask it again. And after you've asked why a few times, you can finally start arriving at some kernel of truth. Polls are simply not designed to do that. Polls reveal how things are, but polls do not help you see very clearly the way that you can change the way things are. Then there are focus groups, which Jerry alluded to. Uh, focus groups were originally based on the theories that support group therapy. However, any therapist who treated a patient using the techniques of a focus group would lose his or her license. We've seen some situations in the corporate world where focus group type of research has some value, particularly around innovation. But even there, where those focus groups are successful, they're really less of focus groups than they are small guided workshops or brainstorming sessions. To understand how people feel uh, about a deep topic, to really explore deep into someone's mind, a focus group is of little or no value. There is no science at all that supports the use of focus groups. A leading democratic research organization, one considered to be among the blue ribbon firms in Washington when it comes to understanding voters, posted to its website several transcripts of some focus groups that it conducted last summer. Here's a list of the questions that were posed to those focus group participants. There are many, many problems with focus groups. I won't get into all of them, but I'll mention two of them here. Number one, moderators typically go into a focus group with a list of predetermined questions many of which, as you can see here, are leading questions. 
So you're really only eliciting reactions to things that the moderator or the study sponsor think are important. You're not exploring the full breadth and depth of people's thinking. Second, this focus group had eight participants who were asked 24 questions over the span of 68 minutes. That amounts to an average of 57 seconds per person per topic. We talked earlier about how to really get into people's minds to understand their beliefs, their biases, their worldview, the stories they tell themselves about themselves and their country. How are you gonna get into that in 57 seconds? There's a better way. Corporate research departments frequently use much more sophisticated methodologies to better understand their consumers and the impact of advertising and other forms of communication. These are improved techniques that are deeply rooted in mind science. Jerry mentioned a couple of them toward the end of his discussion. They are from techniques you know, they're designed to help people understand what they cannot understand about themselves. I say that to say this, we need a new approach. Democrats have lost eight out of the last 13 presidential elections. Our current president has ripped babies from the arms of their mothers and locked them into cages. He's been impeached for brazen corruption. He's lent comfort to white supremacists in Charlottesville. He's besmirched the Oval Office in innumerable ways. Yet, until COVID-19 took over the headlines, polling suggested he was an even money bet to win re-election. If it requires a once in a century pandemic that kills 145,000 Americans for Democrats to defeat that guy, that suggests to us that the Democratic Party is crippled. It's crippled by outdated folk theories of how people think and make decisions. It's crippled by a shallow understanding of American voters. And therefore it's crippled by a profound inability to communicate its values and its vision to those voters. It shouldn't be that way. Next, Gretchen Barton will discuss how Democrats can take real insight about voters and use that as the raw material to bring their party's values to life, specifically through storytelling. Gretchen? Thank you, Dan. I'd like us to imagine heading via time machine 500 years into the future. Now, when we arrive, we're met with a people of future Earth, of course, assuming there's people and there's also an Earth, but I digress. Imagine that you had to describe America to these people, to tell them the story of America. What would you say? What story would you tell? And what story do you wish you could tell? Would there be a difference between the two? For me, when I think about America, I think about hot dogs. I think about freedom. I think about the flag. But most of all, I think about winning. I think we Americans are defined by our singular obsession with winning. We are really into winning. Consider the Olympic opening ceremonies. When the Americans come out, when Simone Biles comes out, you feel a surge of pride, right? Also maybe a surge of desire to go to the gym, but we feel pride because they're ours, but also deep down because we know they're probably gonna win. We're winners, we're number one, it's kind of our thing. Did we declare independence and say, screw it, we're gonna stick with the Brits? Did we storm the beaches of Normandy and fail? No. Did we try to get to the moon and stay on the ground? No. These big wins made possible by massive collective action have long inspired the myth that Americans, as Americans, we, we can win at anything. However, these days we often think of the individual winning, not necessarily the collective. And in the case of elections, we often think of parties winning, not America as a whole. This winning mentality, driven by sports and business and ultimately by capitalism, runs deep in America. Sometimes this drive to win is great, uh, but sometimes this obsession hurts us. A hyper-individualistic win-at-all-cost mentality can hurt us in the long term or cause us to be myopic in our focus missing the fact that we only win big and really have ever won big when we win together. We put so much energy into winning policy debates with Uncle Fred at the Thanksgiving table, working so hard to convince people to come over to our side if we could only just pull out the perfect rhetorical flourish or land the killer zinger that would show them how wrong their policy positions are and how right our policy positions are, then we would be good. 
when we know, we, we know that this doesn't get the job done. And I can testify to this because I've tried this out extensively with my family around every election and in between. We know that winning elections is important, but winning a better America is more important. It's weird that as much as we argue on Twitter or Facebook or at Thanksgiving, and as much polarization as there is out there, Americans agree on quite a lot. When you ask Americans, over 70% across the board agree on the following ideas you see here. Uh, we should tax the wealthy, healthcare is a right, uh, clean air and water, important, the rich control the government, yeah. Background checks, we should have them, voting rights, vote by mail, it's important. Belief in the American dream, and of course recently, policing needs reform. These are quite a significant number of substantive ideas where we can find a coalition around. But why do these ideas work when we're so polarized? Why do we agree on these things? Because they're not policy positions, but components of a larger story. These ideas work because they tie into the larger story of America that most of us buy into, that we should be fundamentally fair, that we are the place where if you work hard enough, you should be able to thrive. That in America, people should have a shot, a voice, a right to life, uh, liberty and happiness, if you will. This story is powerful and is behind every winning issue in America today. Americans, like other humans, resonate with stories, not policies. We want to know the why behind the what. Dr. Uh, Ellen Langer did a study uh, in 1977 at Harvard uh, that was featured in Bob Cialdini's book uh, about persuasion. Uh, it was a fabulous study where she had her research assistants uh, pursue getting copies uh, by cutting the line uh, of people who had been waiting a long time to make copies. Um, there were three asks that the research assistants made when they went to the front of the line and they tried out different ones. The first request was, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine? The second request, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I'm in a rush? And then the third, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the Xerox machine because I have to make copies, right? Kind of nonsensical, right? Well, here's the thing. In terms of the success rate, the first one, Actually, not too bad, considering that people would probably be a little pissed off having someone cut them in line. 60% success, this request was made, uh, met with. The second was met with 94% success. Pretty darn good. But here's the weird thing. The third request was met with 93% success, almost the same as the previous, where someone gave a legitimate reason, right? So why? Why was this successful? Is the word because that magical? I played with this, by the way, and, and no, the word because is not magical. It, it's because our brains crave certainty. We want to know the why behind the what, even if it doesn't make sense. Our brains crave it. And this is exactly why when we say, here's what we're fighting for, but don't give the story behind it, we don't click into the brains of Americans and we don't make sense and we don't win and we need to get this right. We need to change the stories in our culture so that we don't have another Trump, because we will. And the next one may be scarier and more competent. Maybe Biden just so happens to win in 2020. I hope he does. But what happens in 2022, 2024, 2026? Trump is the perfect flower of the stories the right have been sowing for decades. And there are a lot of stories that have been planted in the minds of Americans. And unless and until the left comes up with more compelling stories, the right stories will seem right. They will resonate and they will win every time. Let me leave you with this quote. Politics isn't just a game of clashing parties and competing interests. The right reason is to challenge the status quo, to serve the common good, and to leave this nation better than when we found it. Now, I didn't mean to trick you here. This quote is from Sarah, Sarah Palin. Her perception of what will leave this nation better than what we found it is probably super different than what we think will leave it better. But nevertheless, this is how Republicans tend to think about it. It's not about winning an election. It's not about a 50 plus one strategy or the boom and bust of every election cycle. It is the long game 
And we need to start thinking about winning the long game too, by telling compelling stories and changing the narratives in our culture. Let me now turn it over to my friend and political narrative strategist, Kirk Chaffetz, who will talk about the specific stories Democrats can use to tell, to more successfully communicate their vision. Kirk? Thanks, Gretchen. Hi, everybody. I, Jerry and James and, and Gretchen have done a great job of explaining to us more about how the brain works, how important our unconscious is, and, and clearly how important emotions are. Uh, and I think Gretchen in particular has wonderfully outlined how high the stakes really are at this point. And, and yet, our political speech, which is something I've been working on for the last few years exclusively, clings very stubbornly to facts and logical arguments. I, in 2016, I was lured to the web page you now see by a great online ad that said, see Hillary Clinton's exciting vision for America. So I went right here, and what I found was not exactly a vision. It turned out to be 42 policy memos. Uh, I know because I counted them. I couldn't bring myself to read them all, but I did count them all. And now, in 2020, we've moved on as a party. Joe's vision for America is 43 policy memos. At, at least it was when last I checked, which was Friday. Now, white papers are no way to reach the unconscious. I, I, I know that white reading white papers can render many people unconscious, but they don't really touch our emotions. They don't answer any of the demands that Jerry and James and Gretchen have, have laid out. I, and yet we have a way that we seem to be ignoring that does use the deep metaphors James talks about, that does touch the emotions, that does move people. It's been around for more than 35,000 years. It has not slowed down at all. If anything, it's added a lot of bells and whistles since those first elaborate cave paintings appeared on the walls of the, of the caves in Southern Europe uh, more than 30 millennia ago. But these, these forms of media have in common that they are storytelling. They tell stories. And uh, I've been working on storytelling now for more than 20 years, first as a journalist, uh, then in marketing for major agencies and major corporations, and finally, as I said, in the last few years for progressive politics, up to and including uh, a long stint with one of the presidential candidates in the Democratic primaries. Here's a little of what I've learned while, uh, while doing that work. The scientific consensus is not just that storytelling is a good thing. Storytelling is actually the only thing. Storytelling, as uh, Walter Fisher said in this very uh, influential book, uh, is, is the only form that human communication really takes. And he goes on to, to point out it is neuroscience's conclusion that we are hardwired to recognize and pay attention to stories, and we live our lives, as Fisher says, by constantly checking the fidelity and coherence of the stories that we experience, whether we see them on TV, experience them in our own lives, or told them by a neighbor, read them in a book, on and on. We test those experiences against what we know to be true from the stories we encounter in our own life. And we base all of our decisions uh, on that. Stories are also how we form memories. And Jerry pointed this out in his book, The Mind of a Customer, another book everybody, uh, everybody should think. I think it was actually called How Customers Think, but it explores the mind of the customer. Uh, and as we file our memories by storyline and by stories, another researcher named Fran Francesca Paletta, uh, who is working at Columbia now, a sociologist, points out that, that there's no such thing as a, a story in isolation. These stories get connected in the human brain, and they increase power and form narrative streams as they come together, as they modify one another and change one another. They are so powerful in their interconnections uh, 
that we can actually come to view experiences that we've seen on TV, for example, as equally powerful or maybe even the same as our own experiences. We can turn media narratives into narratives that we internalize and, and believe as our own. And what's most important is that virtually the only way to rewrite these memories, to modify them, to alter them, is with new stories. But new stories can indeed alter them. And, and if, as Robert said when he introduced this entire panel, if the object here is to persuade, this is virtually the only model of persuasion. And yet, once again, stubbornly, democratic political speech uh, keeps overwhelmingly ignoring all of these interconnected stories in people's minds. As James pointed out, the research that we do never reaches them. And I, one great example of this from my own experience, I worked on a project called the Midwest Culture Lab, which was led by young people of color living in the Midwest. It was a national project in scope, but the object was to increase the civic participation and hopefully the, the voting participation of young people, particularly black and brown youth, particularly in the Midwest, but, but all over the country. And what you see here in front of you is the ways in which the establishment has attempted to persuade young people to vote over the last 20 plus years. And that was to tell them to vote, right? To instruct them, go vote, uh, vote or die, as P. Diddy uh, said in the 2004 election. But the problem we found out in our project is that the idea that voting, right, all by itself is going to create change, that's not consistent at all with the experience of young people. In fact, they pushed back at the time in 2018, when we did this study, by saying, hey, look, we voted. We voted and got a black president. And yet, we're still deporting people like crazy. My uncle is still in jail. Po the police are still beating the crap out of us on the streets. Nothing fundamentally has changed. And it's an argument that is extremely hard to counter. And so this, this order, this instruction to go vote simply didn't work because it brought up precisely the wrong stories, the stories that would discourage you from voting. What we did find was that if we told stories or if they told themselves stories about small things that had worked in their neighborhood, how a, a neighborhood block group had gotten a rec center open for a long time, for example, had gotten the lights turned on in a place where the street lamps were broken, whatever, these small victories and, and the agency that they demonstrated to actually change things, groups getting together, making their lives better, that encouraged participation and ultimately encouraged voting. So if you insist on, on you know, white papers and repeating taglines that are devoid of stories, what the latest research really shows is that that has zero impact, precisely zero, when it comes to persuasion. Virtually all of the political speech that we do now, the policies we bring up, the, the, the arguments we try to make, persuade no one. On the other hand, great movements throughout history, right, have been driven by stories. This includes the creation of this country. It certainly includes the civil rights movement. Uh, Dr. King's storytelling was critical in that movement. And, and it's interesting because the story that he chose really to frame the, civil, the entire civil rights movement is one of the meta narratives of freedom and nation building that our entire civilization has ever known. And that's the story of, of, of Exodus. Uh, Dr. King referred to it constantly. It, it helped drive the civil rights movement, inspired people, and ultimately persuaded a majority of Americans to back it. Uh, but that story had also worked for the Jews 3,000 years ago in getting out of Egypt. Uh, it, it was the same story that was appropriated by religious minorities in Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries to get them to the new world. Uh, and it was invoked by the founders of the United States of America. Now, 
James has said we need a new approach. I, I think what, what I've tried to indicate is that it's actually, this new approach is the oldest approach we've had, and it is arguably the only approach we have. So it's about time we turn to it, and that is to tell a compelling story. Now, what story should we tell? The research, to sum it up, is very clear. Uh, and, and I think our common sense agrees and our experience of history agrees that it's a story that's hopeful and optimistic. It shows that something can be done. It's a story that, that imagines a better world. It's populated by authentic characters. It shows that we have the power to achieve our dreams if we act collectively in particular. Uh, and it is told in ways that connect with the stories that exist in people's minds. So it, it connects with their reality and it strengthens itself by joining other narratives inside people's heads. Such a powerful story of yes, winning, but more importantly, why winning would, would have to tell uh, what it would mean to win. What is it that we're fighting for? What's gonna happen the day after we win the election? or we win this particular argument. How's the world going to change? This is especially important to motivate people who are on the fence or haven't made up their minds, who are looking for guidance. It's critical to persuasion that we tell these kinds of stories. Beating Trump is absolutely critical. I don't think anybody argues with that, certainly not listening to this, uh, but it's not enough. Here's a quote from uh, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, after Lincoln, my favorite Republican president. It, fundamentally, he, he said this 60 years ago, and, and all these years later, what we understand, right, is that the Republican Party has become exactly what I feared. It is, in fact, not a political party anymore. It is merely a conspiracy to seize power. Uh, my concern is that we don't want the Democratic Party to become yet another conspiracy to seize power. The power of the Democratic Party comes from the story that it should be telling about inclusion and equity in America, and yet we're not telling the compelling story. And so we could easily win this election, because at this point, it's all about how badly Trump is performing rather than anything Joe Biden has said that is driving the numbers. We could win this election and still easily lose our country. And I think what's critical to build this party into a moral force, to build the super majorities, we really need a big story that will move people. And with that, I, I want to turn this over to Simone, who is going to talk about making the words we and us actually embrace all of us. Simone? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, boy, most of you use some amazing and powerful words, but I'm going to try to use some of them in my introduction because I kind of uh, connect the tissues here for me. Uh, Jerry talks about the story, what the story is about, and talks about the collective meaning. And then uh, ending with you, Kirk, you talked about inclusion and equity. The, 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 the most amazing and interesting thing for, from a Latino multicultural perspective is we have felt oftentimes that we don't exist in the story. Or if we are in the story, we are the villains in the story. Uh, I, I don't want to go back too far, but suffice to say, that uh, President Trump decided to launch his campaign in New York, coming down the elevator by bashing Latinos, immigrant values, and all those uh, ugly words he used. So I think the starting point I want to share with, with everyone is from a Hispanic perspective, we have not been part of the we. And no matter, we have been sacrificing our lives in every single war in this country. Actually, the first Marine that died in the first Gulf War were Sergeant Gutierrez, who, who was an undocumented Latinos. So no matter what, we have, what we've been trying to do what we, or we continue to do, 
we are not part of the narrative. So to me, that's kind of the starting point. But Trump, Trump is only a very minor uh, symbol because I want to go back and start, go back to Samuel Huntington. And I know probably Jerry met him at some point. Uh, Mr. Huntington wrote an amazing book 30 years ago. He talked, uh, the, the Clash of Civilization, a brilliant book, absolutely uh, uh, prophetic in the way he, he saw the uh, Muslim fundamentalism threat to Western societies and to Western values. However, before he died, he wrote a very shallow book, in my opinion, that uh, says, who are we? And that book really kind of introduced uh, Donald Trump before Trumpism became what it is today, because Professor, uh, Professor Huntington at the time spoke from a white Anglo-Saxon mindset saying the United States values uh, will be impacted, we're going to be downgraded by this pollution of Hispanic immigration, more so the Mexican component of this group is least educated and least assimilated. We're going to be history if we continue with this. So we, the, 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 biggest, the biggest question that he was asking, he was talking about is, quote, assimilation, Latinos or immigrant Latinos refuse to assimilate. But history and the American uh, generosity of spirit proved them wrong because most immigrants at some point had to decide to be or not to be. To be an American, fully American, meant to shed everything else you brought with you or your family came up with. But again, the, his, the, the Hispanic experience, thank, thanks to the generosity of the American spirit, proved him wrong because today, more than ever, most Latinos believe a good way of being a citizen is to be bicultural. So we can be both. I can be an American and I can still be a proud Latino. They, they don't contradict th themselves. So this is part of the new we, this is part of the new reality that, that we have to accept. Now, uh, James talked about the cupcake and this is where the, the interesting thing I love, I've been seeing a cupcake all my life here. Now. Cupcakes are really this, this shallow approach to culture. And when it comes to Latinos, and I mean everybody from Ronald Reagan and on, but I wanna focus on, on the Democratic for today. I wanna talk about Obama and, and, and Clinton. Both of them use a bunch of cupcakes, the photo op with mariachi, but this superficial look at the culture is really nothing but a, but a mirage. Now. I wish I invented this word, but I did not, but I love it. This new thing that's been going on for years, but someone smarter than me found a way to, to, to express it, the Hispandering. And actually, it, every, every election cycle, most politicians, but more so the Democrats who've been taking us for granted for ages, uh, you know, they pander to us. Now, I, I know this now looks as a joke, but it happened. You know, uh, Marco Rubio was on the cover of Time magazine calling him the savior of the Republican Party. This is not a joke, this really happened. And the one on the left, which was kind of interesting, this is, this is a kind of a semi quiz. Think about if only 5%, 5% more Hispanic voted in the last election, Trump would not be, would, wouldn't be a president today. So the millennials, the Latinx millennials are absolutely crucial to be part of this new narrative, but they have to be, they have to see themselves reflected in what's going on. And nowadays they only see themselves on the cover of magazine, but nothing beyond that. There's no meaning conversation going on. Now, on top of that, I, there is something else that I call the reductionist mindset, the reductionist uh, concept. James, if we don't mind switching to the next slide. So, yeah, no, next one, yes. So this is, this is what most Americans see today about the Hispanic culture, the wall, right? And that's what Trump brought to the surface, the wall. And then the throw them in jail, throwing kids in jail. This is, this is a cultural context that quote, the, the American media in general is trying to define what Hispanic reality is all about, right? 
And that is, that is part of the fallacy. That is part of the problem that today that Hispanic don't, don't, they don't seem as excited. For, for, for some reason, 28% of Latinos voted for Trump. God knows why, but 28% of Hispanic voted for Trump. So we need to move beyond that. We need, we need to go beyond this uh, uh, reductionist concept of what the Hispanic culture is all about. Now, on the next slide, if you don't mind, James. This is, this is a, an absolute uh, key moment for us in, in, this, in this time of days. The, the, Me, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter, all these issues matter to Hispanics, but we have also been as much victims as everyone else, yet rarely, rarely we make the news. We are suffering the same abuses when it comes to segregation and discrimination. Even, even when it comes to the, on the COVID-19, you know, we have been more severely hit than anyone else, yet you don't see that Hispanic tragedy uh, uh, on television today. So the road to justice is, is absolutely long and, 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 and it's not gonna be easy, but we have to believe that it exists. We have to believe that it, it matters to us, but it, it has to affect us in a way that will change our future. Now, the Charlottesville, uh, all, everything that is happening today is touching Latinos on many levels. But the biggest question and the biggest challenge for us when we talk about the new narrative, this new narrative has to talk about the trust. Can we trust the system to take care of us just as we have trusted each other for so long? From a Hispanic perspective, the new reality is we are the new USA, we as in a collective. And as my friend, Dr. Morris Liebman said uh, last week, he said, well, wait a minute, we're all strangers. We all, we're, when we came here, we were all strangers. We, were, we are strangers as well, but now we're part of the family. So this is my last thought about the new narrative when it comes to Hispanic is, America has changed. The demographic and cultural shifts are impacting us on many levels and the new story has to express this change. And thank you, everybody. As I said, uh, we're gonna take some questions now. And once again, I will direct you to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question, I'll submit it and I will see that it asks. Um, the first question uh, seems to be uh, directed at the impressiveness of the group. Um, and it is, has your group been hired by the Democratic Party to help with the 2020 election? Uh, to disseminate their message. And I will let you decide who's gonna answer these questions. Well, we've made valiant attempts, I'll say that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and we're very keen on, on supporting the democratic effort in, in 2020 and beyond. And uh, we've been in communication with a number of people who are political strategists and researchers and campaign folks. Um, but we are fine. Well, we have found that this is this is in a, in a sense a, a new message, a new uh, the idea of, of narrative and storytelling is something that's really only being picked up um, recently, and and so uh, so we're still working on it. And uh, here's a question. Um, I'm not going to read the names, but I agree with the impact of storytelling. So where or who is the Democratic Party's Lincoln Project, which I think has been very effective? Yeah. Uh, and as the questions, questioner says, they are incredibly effective in their, in their storytelling narrative. And they want to know who, who, who on the Democratic side is comparable to, to the Lincoln Project. Boy. <laughs> let, me take, I, let me take a stab at this. And I, I'll take a stab uh, at this. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. I, I'll take a stab at it first by pushing back a little on the assumptions and uh, the answer that the question provides. Uh, the Lincoln Project has been great at setting uh, the Twitterverse alight uh, and, has, uh, and their, their ads are really, really clever. The, the difficulty in my mind is that they are absolutely preaching to the converted. Uh, they're taking a negative approach which actually the most recent research uh, tends to demonstrate that the negative just doesn't work. Uh, in fact, I've seen some uh, 
I, I've seen some research on other, on democratic run uh, ads that are not dissimilar from, uh, from the Lincoln projects that say that at best, right, if everything goes well, uh, the negative ads attacking Trump have zero effect on persuading anybody. And on a bad day, they create a backlash that improves uh, Trump's numbers. Uh, the backlash is insignificant, you'll be happy to hear, but basically if none of that money were spent, nothing would change. So while I admire their spirit, and while I think they may have something to say to some Republicans who need reinforcement uh, in being disgusted with Trump, uh, the evidence that I've seen says it's not doing a whole lot in terms of moving the base. And uh, here, here is a practical question. Uh, with the polls indicating Biden with a significant electoral lead over Trump, how will or can the Democrats mitigate overconfidence and complacency? Uh, I'm gonna take a quick stab at this. I think learning from the previous elections where 99.9% .9 of the polls indicated Hillary was winning. I don't trust, I'm sorry, I don't trust the polls. I think that's an illusion. Uh, so I'll, I'll let someone else finish, but I don't trust the polls at all. And I think it would be foolish for the Democrats to make the same mistake as they did with Hillary the last time. Yeah, I, and I'll just, I mean, I'll, I'll pick up this. And I, the, in my mind, it would be foolish to become overconfident. Uh, first of all, the polls, while they tell us what the electorate is thinking, uh, they, they don't do a terribly reliable job of modeling who's going to turn out. That's, that's the real problem here. So we, we, although we may know how people are going to vote, they're only going to vote that way if they show up to vote. And our real problem is, is turnout and making sure that everybody shows up. Uh, so the results mirror what we're seeing in the poll. Now, that's a big if. And if you're feeling overconfident, uh, especially if you're white and you're feeling overconfident, I would recommend you go talk to some young black voters or some young Latinx voters uh, and ask them how well motivated they are to turn out and vote for Joe Biden at this point. The, the answers, uh, if, if you ask enough people, will not be terribly encouraging for you. And we still have a lot of work to do getting everybody out and motivated and active. And that's really what this storytelling is about, is how do we engage a wider group? How do we make everybody understand that there's something really important in this for all of us, that, that we can change things? And here's a question I think that goes to Jerry's deep metaphor and being uh, sufficiently vague to let everybody in on the, on the metaphor. And the question is, how do you encourage uh, the young voters and not turn off the moderates and the independents? And, and shouldn't we be moving away from identity politics and intersectionality? Well, what is often missed both in storytelling and messaging generally is you can't have two individuals, two groups, two communities differ from one another without there being a common denominator. Uh, so people may differ where they fall on a particular continuum, um, but there is a shared dimension. And it turns out in, in marketing world, which I think extends here, that the shared dimension along which or across which people will vary is more important than their uh, different positions. So the critical challenge uh, is to go deep enough into someone's thinking or the thinking of diverse people and find uh, what the underlying value or dimension uh, is and make sure your story addresses that effectively. Thank you, Jerry. And 
And this question, I think I, I know the answer to having listened to you, but I'm gonna ask it. Um, what is being done currently to amplify Biden's policy messages, economy, client, and so on, uh, as he shares them so that voters can really understand what he will do for them? Uh, they're asking what's going on right now? Uh, not much. <laughs> Kirk, maybe you're seeing something that I'm not, or Gretchen, but uh, uh, I don't see any of that right now from his campaign. That's why I thought I knew the answer. Um, <laughs> and here we have a question is, um, Hollywood is where the storytellers are. Why aren't they more involved? Let me take a, a stab at this. First, the one project that I have been active on, which will get unveiled next week, is a the attempt to create a sort of master storytelling guide precisely for the folks in Hollywood and for television showrunners and for artists of all kinds. And that's, that's being run by a group called Culture Surge, which is actually a newly formed amalgam of other groups on the progressive left. Uh, and, uh, and one of those groups is Harness, which is run by America Ferrara, who I think a lot of you may have heard of. So there, there are real efforts going on to, uh, to involve the people in, who really tell stories for a living in picking up this sort of core story and making of it whatever they will, right? Telling it in their own way with their own creative spin. Those efforts are underway, and I, I'm deeply interested in those kinds of efforts because I happen to think that storytellers tell stories best. Uh, but and great politicians are great storytellers, and we just we've run out of them at the moment. So, and this is a question, I guess, uh, directed specifically to, to to what you would do yourselves. But the question is, um, what kind of ads would you suggest uh, for the Biden campaign? Or is that an unfair question? And you want to take the Fifth Amendment? <laughs> Kirk, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I, I never take the Fifth Amendment when it comes to giving Joe Biden advice, but I, the, or any politician. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, first of all, Joe Biden's greatest strength, and, and the reason that, that I thought the ad that you couldn't hear, I agree with Jerry, is the best one of the cycle that Unite the Country made. It, it begins with Joe's uh, personal story. When, when Joe is personal, when, when he tells the story of his working class upbringing, he is extremely powerful and he needs to lean on his biography more. And I know he's getting that same advice from other people in the democratic orbit. That's number one. Number two, this, this story needs to be amplified, not just by the usual suspects, but by people who are authentically in the audiences that we're trying to reach. That's what really works. And I've seen the numbers on this stuff and it's dramatic. If you can get a young black voter to tell his story or her story and why he or she is voting for Biden and what he or she expects to happen because of that vote, that's a very powerful message. And it can be rendered in 30 second spots for TV. It can be lengthened into uh, much broader storytelling online. Uh, and it can be picked up by, uh, by news media to be amplified. So, I mean, that's what I, that's, that's what I think we're all recommending that Joe do is it's sort of all of the above. Well, if storytelling is important, and, I, and I'm sure we're all convinced that it is, um, based on your presentation, how do the Democrats combat uh, Trump's very, very uh, easy to understand conspiracy theories and the outright lies uh, that bolster them. If one party is going to be telling the truth and the other is going to be dealing with conspiracy theories, uh, is, isn't this an unfair fight? Mm, well, not necessarily, because you can t if you can spin a conspiracy theory to sound credible, you ought to be able to spin the truth to sound credible. Uh, so I think if 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 the Democratic Party and Democratic candidates can portray a, as Kirk mentioned, a forward-looking, 
message that communicates those values in a powerful way, it can make those conspiracy theories look like the nonsense that they are. And, and along the same line, um, what is it about Trump's base that makes them so intractable and un unchangeable in the face of uh, overwhelming evidence that much of what they hold true is not true? Okay. Simone, it, oh. I mean, yeah, a couple of points. I think uh, the, the fringe that supports Trump has always existed in this country regardless. So he just found ways to make them more uh, vocal, more expressive. But I think that that fringe has always existed and Kirk could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that base has always been there. And if I may add to, he speaks to their emotional needs on a profoundly deep level. He understands their hopes and fears. And one of the things that I don't think Democrats always understand is the power of community, the centrifugal force of being within a community, and the fact that if they were to leave their affinity, their group for Trump, they would lose their entire crew. They would lose their community. They would lose their people. And that's a big cost. And, and I think that, that sort of tees up this question is, um, do you suggest um, th that the Democrats attempt to have meetings um, with the Republicans uh, to trade their stories um, under the theory that, that the, the light is, a, is the best disinfectant, even better than Lysol? Yes, although everyone should wear masks. Um, <laughs> but there's certainly an argument for sitting around a table. Of course, in the age of COVID, it's kind of a weird time to do that, but certainly being able to share lived experiences, you can't deny that. And it's a, it can be a really productive thing to speak to each other across the table. I want to add to the previous question about messaging from a democratic platform. I think uh, some kind of powerful message about healing and reconciliation have to be part of Joe Biden message because that's kind of the answer to the to what Trump is going to be throwing trying to win the next election but i think reconciliation and healing are a good a, a starting process for this whatever new society we're going to be building and i agree with everything that simone and uh, and gretchen uh, and james have just said one one additional point that's important because i often hear people you know lamenting democrats lamenting that the democrats you know don't use the tactics that the republicans use we don't lie enough we don't make up stuff enough uh, i hate to lengthen your reading list but there's another great book called network propaganda by a bunch of of quant researchers believe it or not who point out, and I won't go into the whole argument, but there's about 70% of the country that actually clings to the truth and is interested in facts. And uh, most of those, and, and those are the Democrats and most independents. There is a hardcore, uh, someone called them the fringe, I agree. I found them in various studies to be somewhere between 20 and 28% of the country who really cling to falsehoods and who are are so afraid and feel so marginalized and victimized that they would rather believe the myth than search for a way out, really. So it's, I think we should never mistake the, the audience we're trying to reach with the audience we can't reach and that we acknowledge we can't reach everybody. That's, that's important. Yeah. You're, you're just, if I could just build I could just build on that and refer back to an earlier question about the uh, conspiracy theorist. Um, an old adage is a good politician always runs scared. But a, a good politician in running scared cannot be or should not be distracted. There's a, a segment of the population, those who are attentive to, who will buy into conspiracy theories that I frankly would not waste my time with uh, in terms of resources to convince them to change their mind. Um, that's not going to happen in a short time. What is required in a single ad do it, you need a, a, a sort of a program of message that fall together and convey that in the Biden case, that he has vision, 
he has wisdom and he has courage and telling those truths well i think should just be the the primary goal tell it over and over with you know different uh nuances um and not get trapped into trying to combat all these crazy conspiracy theories what worries me the most is not um uh attracting that middle group as it were people who are undecided who may be leaning one way or the other these are the folks if who if they are unclear uncertain about what a candidate at any level of government stands for what their story is uh they will tend not to vote and to me that's where this election is going to be determined by getting that that substantial middle group to vote uh democratic and abraham lincoln said that if ever our democracy will be destroyed will be destroyed from within and the the question is is part of the messaging or story dilemma that the intended audience uh, does not understand how government is supposed to work and doesn't really understand uh, the, the, how democracy is supposed to work or is that a flawed premise um i don't know kirk what do you what do you think of that question i'm not sure that our, our societies become collectively dumber over the last 50 years so i don't know that any we have any less of an understanding of how democracy is supposed to work today than we ever did um i do think we have been more successful in the past educating people on how democracy is supposed to work right i i i think part of one of the big problems bob i think is is that and, and it's the problem that i alluded to in the story about the voting stuff uh, i i our democracy isn't working in the way it's supposed to work at the moment that's the hard truth uh, people are being blocked from voting uh problems persist uh corporate power is huge the you know the income inequality is at a record high and getting worse all the time and so what we it isn't that people don't understand how democracy is supposed to work in my experience it, they they have lost faith in ever getting to work in getting democracy to be democracy and that's that i believe is the fight we have to take on this is a question of motivation and possibility not lack of knowledge it's it's an emotional problem it is a problem of faith and and will not a problem of knowledge if if people uh understand that the united states department of justice is being used as the personal lawyer to the president um but they fail to comprehend that that is not the function of of the justice department it is to represent the interests of the people um what the, what may be an outrage don't you agree uh is more easily accepted uh, as a, as a new norm i i disagree with that i mean i think if you were to ask ask americans the question do you think the justice department should be the president's personal lawyer or the lawyer for all the people at least 70% plus would say it should be the lawyer for all the people i have no doubt about that as a matter of polling and i i don't think you do either really don't you think people would answer that way are you asking me I merely pass the questions along. <laughs> I mean, I think another way to answer your question, I find it appalling, literally appalling that uh Wallace on Fox News does one interview with Trump and he exposed him and now the whole there's so much hoopla about wow, what an amazing job. The question I want to ask everybody here and and think about it is when we talk about democracy and and the role of media in this democracy why why did it take so long for the media to do its job facing trump i, I don't have the answer i just i want to ask everybody if they if they have a way to explain this to me here's a question from the panel for the panelists anybody want to take that it's mind boggling one interview and like we're making history someone finally confronting trump with his lies Well I and I think I mean as the former journalist on, on the panel I guess I have to partially take this one. I uh, 
first of all, I think that, that the media were completely unprepared for Trump. They, they really are completely unprepared for someone who presents fiction as fact from, from the Oval Office. It's a tough gig. I, you know, I've done a little coverage of the White House in the, in the distant past, uh, and you just don't expect that to happen. So I think that was number one. Number two, I think this was just the Fox phenomenon. It wasn't, it wasn't that it was amazing that anybody had challenged the president. Lots of reporters have challenged the president and called him a goofball and a liar uh, to his face at various press conferences. It's why he doesn't do them anymore. Uh, the, what was interesting was that it was on Fox, or that's what was interesting to all of the, new, the network news that wasn't Fox. I think that, that's all that was about. Well, that's my personal obviously. Since we're talking about um, the narrative and the media, uh, do you agree that the center has collapsed in American politics and that the extremes on both the left and the right now control the narrative? And if, if so, how do we bring it back to the center? I'm going to, I'll do this quick, quick answer and I'll let someone else finish it. Historically, on both sides, candidates would go to the extreme to become candidates, but to win the election, they always came back to the center, with the exception of Trump. And that's, that's kind of the, the past. Now, the future, I, I have no idea. But I do believe what I said earlier about Biden's trying to talk about healing and reconciliation, because that's only the, the starting of a process. But I don't think that's a full answer. Yeah, and I'd like to add a partial answer too, so someone can glom on too. But I, I think at this point in American history, we're looking at uh, the parties uh, as as almost two different planets with their own gravitational poles. We're not exhibiting the same. We we don't breathe the same air. We're reading different things on social media. We're consuming news from profoundly different sources. And so our realities, I mean, this has been made before, but uh, our realities are completely different. And so it's hard to coalesce around ideas when you live uh, in two distinctly different places. Um, and so I think if we're going to talk about finding a center, and there's an argument that, you know, we should we find a center, or should we move the Overton window one way or another? But if we're going to talk about that, we have to talk about finding a shared set of facts and ideas, which includes a lot of implications for social media and, and our news cycle. I would also, I would disagree a little bit with the premise of the question, a little bit. Uh, the, the question talked about how the, the, the far left and the far right control the media narrative. I don't see the far left controlling the media narrative in, in any way, shape or form. There are a lot of Democrats from Joe Manchin to AOC and Bernie Sanders and everyone in between that represent quite a large range of the spectrum. It's not the case on the Republican side. You have Mitt Romney, sort of, and then everyone else marching in lockstep with the totalitarian president. Uh, so I'm, I'm not really sure about both sides in it in that way. I think that's exactly right. In terms of communicating uh, the negative, which you seem to, to suggest was not effective, um, do you think the Democrats uh, need to communicate effectively that Trump wins the election, the Republicans may reduce funding for Social Security and Medicare, uh, there'll be no comprehensive effort to contain the virus, um, disproportionate uh, intrusion by uh, federal police, um, uh, more unqualified judges and so on. How important do you think that message is or should you stay on the positive side? I'd stay on the positive. I think that message is getting through really mm -hmm. well. Uh, and, and doesn't need a lot of a lot of help from anybody other than Donald Trump, who so far is beating himself badly in the polls by continuing to be more and more extreme. I think it's the positive message. What's in it for us to vote for Joe Biden? How's he going to really change things? Mm -hmm. That's really critical. Uh, there, there, there's been no mention here uh, about gender and how that affects the story voters want to hear. Um, do you have any thoughts on this, um, the gender issue? <laughs> I have no oh, thoughts. I, 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 thank God for experience. I, I also, I, I got 
drafted, oddly enough, to, uh, to work for nearly a year on a major national study of gender justice. What would it take to bring it about? So uh, obviously, uh, there's a gender gap that Trump is facing. It's getting worse and worse for him, obviously. Uh, people who identify themselves as women are, appear to have a political division versus people who identify themselves as men. There are other genders. Uh, and without getting into, into that entire discussion, uh, most, most of the others are on, tend to be on the left. I don't think that it affects the story other than that women like men are very attuned to positive stories of the future. How do I make the story future? Mothers in particular have a real interest in raising kids who will be able to survive and thrive uh, in the world of the future. They want their kids to be accepted for who they are, even in some ways they've got more emotional attachment to that than fathers. That's a, you know, a summary of like, you know, 20 years of research that I've spent both consumer research and the more recent gender justice stuff. So I don't think it affects the fundamental story at all, other than that the, the positive and the future and what's going to happen next, or if anything, somewhat more important to women than to men, but they're really important to everyone. With my apologies uh, to all of those whose questions we have not reached, uh, I've just received a notice from the higher ups uh, that, that I am um, to wrap this up. Um, so I, I want to thank our, our panelists for a really uh, fascinating discussion. And uh, I hope that the Democrats uh, will find a way to hear your message and come up with a story because I, for one, uh, am totally convinced um, that the messaging must change. Um, and I have uh, one uh, short announcement, um, which is that on July 28th at noon, uh, we will have another webinar um, with Margaret Good uh, and her journey for Congress and Andy Mele, candidate for Florida's House District number 71. And I encourage you all uh, to go to the Longboat Key Democratic site and register for that up and coming webinar. And uh, with that, I, I, I thank you for this fascinating discussion. Um, and I guess we're wrapping it up. Thanks so much, everybody. Stay thank well. you. Bye-bye.